Thank you, worship team. I love our worship team. I love Jose and Laura, but we know the real talent in the family is Leah. Good job, Leah. <laughs> but by the way, she was keeping beat better than uh, me, so good job. Um, we, are, we are talking about rats. We're talking about lobsters. We're talking about bouncing balls today. But more importantly, we're talking about hope. And with that, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for um, being a God that always has your hands extended to us, always is relentlessly pursuing us, is a God that asks us to wait uh, for your timing, for you know what's best. When we feel we are at rock bottom, you give us this thing called hope. Help us live in this hope and know that your arms are always open to us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So today we are talking, like I said, about hope, and not just any hope. It is a hope overflowing. But first I want to talk about rats. If you are a rat lover, you are going to hate this story. If you hate rats, you're going to love this story. Um, and so I was reading, which is probably surprising to you all, but I was reading um, this, this article uh, about this the study scientists were doing. They would take rats and put them in a tank filled with water and see how long they would last. Like I said, if, you were, if you're a rat lover, you're going to hate this. Um, but the average was they would last about 17 minutes before they would drown. Now, these are cute rats. Picture disease-infested rats for this story to make this more palpable. But they tried it again with different rats, obviously, and <laughs> these other rats, once 17 minutes came around and they thought they were on their last leg or tail, they pulled them out and they gave them some food, they dried them off, and they let them sleep. And about a couple days later, they put them back in the tank. I know, cruel. I mean, this is not my, I didn't make this up. I'm not a scientist. This is just a story I'm sharing with you, rat haters in the group. They said, Brian, tell the story about rats. And, oh, I'm doing it. This is for you. But, so they took new rat, these rats that they saved, and then they did it again. They noticed that once 17 minutes came around, once an hour came around, once three hours came around, and after 36 hours, these rats were still hanging on. So they pulled them out, and they realized the difference is this. These rats have experienced what hope looks like. They lived in a life of hope. They saw a change happen, and they lived in this expectant hope. Now, I'm going to tell you what hope is not real quick. Hope does not equal wishful thinking. Maybe this has been part of our vocabulary with hope that we, we've, we've made it this wishful thinking thing. Whereas, like I say, I hope the Packers are going to win the Super Bowl. That's wishful thinking. There's a good chance, in fact, a factual chance that they're not going to win the Super Bowl this year. Um, all right, so it is not wishful thinking. Hope is also not optimism, all right? It's not living an optimistic life. That is not equivalent. So if you're drowning in the ocean and you say to yourself, well, at least I'm getting a great tan or burning some calories, that does not equal hope, all right? Do you see that? That is not the same thing as hope. And I want you all to say this with me. Hope equals a confident expectancy. Let's say that together. Hope equals a confident expectancy. All right, as hopeful Christians, we live with one foot in the present, but one foot also in the future. We live in a life of a hopeful, a positive, a confident expectancy. We have not seen Christ coming, but we know Christ is coming with a confident expectancy. We have this hope. We have not seen God, but we have this hope. We have witnessed, we have encountered this transformation of God in our lives. So we live in this hope-filled life. In fact, I would say, I would dare say, Ryan, you dare say, I do dare say that it's impossible to be a Christian without hope. Now, that being said, I have been walking with some of you in this room that would say, Ryan, I really don't have a lot of hope right now. Some of you have been going through job transitions, job losses, financial 
heartbreak, relationship heartbreak, some very serious health issues where tomorrow does not look better than today, where hope is this rope you're hanging on and you are running out, where maybe the, the rope isn't even there anymore and you're saying, Ryan, I, I really don't think hope is part of my vocabulary right now. This is painful. This hurts. And these words come to mind, these sentences. Why is God testing me like this? Why is God punishing me like this? And it's hard to live a life filled with hope when you think this God is punishing you or, or, or trying you like this. Lobster. I heard a rabbi tell the story of a rob- lobster, um, rock lobster, of a lobster, we'll call it a lobster tail, if you will. Um, <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Um, hope you're hungry. Caribbean lunch, right after this. Um, but lobsters are just a squishy creature. Did you know that? Lobsters are squishy creatures wrapped up in a very hard shell. And the lobsters grow, but the shells really don't. So during their growth process, it is very painful for these lobsters. They get stuck in this excruciating pain, and they know it's time to shed their shell. So they shed that shell, and then they grow another one bigger and stronger than the one before. And they get to this point where there's pain, there's uncomfort, and then they shed the shell, and they keep growing in that. The outcome is they are a bigger, stronger lobster at the end of it than when they began. And it was a painful process. I remember my dad telling me of a teacher he had um, that was just kind of very strict, sometimes mean, would assign exorbitant amounts of homework for seemingly no reason. And he despised this teacher. He said he hated this teacher. And it wasn't until years later when he thought back on it The teacher that most shaped him, that most formed him into growth and to be a a well-rounded student was this specific teacher that he thought had it out for him, but in reality was helping him grow, was helping him be a better person. Now, I want to tell you guys this. Those of you wrestling with the fact that maybe God is putting you to test or God is punishing you, perhaps God isn't punishing you, but maybe God is, in fact, preparing you. Maybe God is using this this space of heartbreak, of brokenness, that I would say God didn't orchestrate, but God is going to use to help you grow, to help you get stronger, help you grow closer to him. If you remember the wonderful story of Moses in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, we see that Moses confronts Pharaoh. And this was not an easy thing to do. Moses had a, a, um, a speech impediment. He had a stutter. Um, and, and he had some, some concerns about going in front of Pharaoh. But we all know how the story goes, right? He goes in front of Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, okay, sounds good. And lets his people go, right? No. He goes and says, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. There has been some plagues, some hardships. And in fact, it comes to the end where God actually hardens Pharaoh's heart. Hardens Pharaoh's heart in order to say, this is impossible to be moved. And guess what? Pharaoh is moved regardless and the people are let go. And then they finally, when they are let go, Pharaoh's armies decide to go after him after all. And they get to this body of water. And God doesn't say, you know what, maybe actually go around the water. Or God doesn't say, Moses, you should probably start building a boat and just go across the water. But God says, you know what, this is an impossible situation. Watch me work in the impossible, in the sea parts. God loves to work in the impossible. And some of you are in an impossible place right now. Bouncy balls. This is something that uh, my son Ben discovered when he first started walking. He had a bouncy ball, and it was mesmerizing to him at that time. Um, And he noticed, and he made this discovery. This is why I know Ben is smart, gets it from the mom's side of the family. Um, That Ben is smart because he noticed that when he dropped it on the kitchen floor, it would bounce. When he bounced it on the carpet, it would not bounce as high. When Ben went outside, when he bounced the ball on the concrete, 
it would bounce high, but when he bounced it on the grass, it would not bounce. And he made this dramatic theological discovery that I am translating for you right now. (laughs) Hope gives us this opportunity to bounce back. These bouncy balls were created to bounce. That is their purpose. They were named that way for that very reason. We were created to bounce back. Did you know that? We are not created to be left in a pit of despair, but we are created to bounce back. But did you know what? The harder the bottom, the higher the bounce. The deeper you are in this despair, I promise you, years from now, you're going to look back and say, wow, God was faithful. I bounced back even higher than I thought God would be able to pull me out of. God does his best work when we think God is not there. Let me end with this. It's very easy for us to live in this life of impossible, to live in the life of self and me. But through Christ, we are given this thing called hope, where we can put our trust not so much in the why or the how or the where, but we can trust in the who, and that's Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us this thing called hope, this thing that gives us life. God, sometimes we find ourselves in the bottom, rock bottom, and we think tomorrow will not be better than today. And you promise us that whether on this side of eternity or the next, that things will get better, that we walk in the uh, footsteps of a resurrected Savior, that death and dying and weeping will be no more because your son, your son died for us and then rose again for us. Thank you for this hope, God. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen.